Hello everybody, and today I've managed to get my hands on ATI's last dual GPU graphics card, the HD 4850X2. Now, this is an old card, it lacks modern features, and by today's standards has long since been e-waste. But it's f***ing cool. This card was made when Crossfire and SLI were in their prime, and this dual GPU solution was a high-end beast. Yet, it was overshadowed by its older brother, and no one really talks about it. So what made it so good? Now, this card released in 2008 is part of ATI's HD 4000 series. Games like Crisis, Far Cry, and Left 4 Dead were some of the most popular titles, and they all supported multi-GPU systems. <coughs> But the 4850X2 wasn't that. It was an enthusiast level card meant for those who had plenty of money and wanted top notch performance. It also wasn't the fastest. In fact, the 4870X2 came out beforehand with a higher core clock, newer VRAM, and cost $100 more. The 4850X2 was for those who didn't want to pay the premium for the aforementioned card but still needed two GPUs, and that wasn't a lot of people. In fact, the only vendor to manufacture the card was Sapphire, and its price dropped by 25% only three months after its initial release. Sections. Did I just strip? the screw you know what what if i just use pliers to take a screw out we got it we finally got the last screw oh my god dude i did a number on that thing now this card is equipped with two terascale r700 processors which isn't actually what the 4850 used 4850s were equipped with a single rv770 processor but the chips are identical aside from the r700 having a higher tdp together the 4850x2 had two processors each with 800 shading units 40 texture mapping units 16 render output units 10 compute units and 64 Z stencils all using 956 million transistors built on TSMC's 55 nanometer process. Our model also pairs each GPU with half a gig of GDDR3 memory in a 256 bit bus, although two gig models did exist. All this was a large increase over the previous generation's 3850X2, and this one came with higher clock speeds and more VRAM. They also improved crossfire scaling and upgraded these cards with a brand new PLX chip. The 4850X2 used a PEX8647 which manages PCIe bandwidth and allows the GPUs to communicate with each other. This was a major upgrade and actually doubled the bandwidth over the previous generation's 3850X2, which used a PEX8547. Oh, that shit's nasty. Okay, yeah, that looked a lot cleaner from the outside. They literally just gave it like two Intel stock heat sinks and said that's good enough. So the 4850X2 was bigger, better, and had to compete, primarily against Nvidia's GeForce 9 and eventually 200 series. The 4850X2 was often compared against the much more expensive GTX 280, and it won, with one reviewer dubbing it the GTX 280 killer. It was able to deliver more performance at a cheaper price, and could also power four monitors simultaneously, which was twice as much as the 280. So why don't we still have multi-GPU graphics cards? Well, aside from increased power consumption and heat in such a small area, game compatibility was limited, and developers didn't have a need to add multi-GPU support to their games. They were also prone to micro-stuttering due to uneven frame pacing, which could make games feel less smooth despite having higher average frame rates. Ours also only supports up to DirectX 10. This card came out in 2008 and we're not going to be able to start most modern games on it. All right, and the card's all back together. Let's uh, go see if it works. For the test system, we used a Protus 400 G1 with an i7-4790, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and Windows 7 running on an SSD. It's not the most powerful system, but I'm on a budget, so consider leaving a like, commenting, or subscribing because every interaction helps. Thanks. Now I bought this card for $30 online in an untested condition and wasn't sure if it even worked. Luckily it spun to life and driver installation finished up quickly without a hitch. The first thing I noticed was the idle noise level. It's kind of hard to miss, and this is one of the loudest cards I've had in a while. We also got this lovely little notification from Windows, but the first test we did was with Passmark. Fortunately, it actually showed up as a dual GPU graphics card as shown in this cool little motherboard animation, so it was mostly working correctly. So I ran the test at stock speeds, no overclocking, just wanted the good baseline, and it didn't do too well. Got a score of 972, which placed it in the 15th percentile, meaning 75% of identical cards have outperformed it. So our card isn't the best best, but can it run Crisis Warhead? I used the optimal settings feature, which set everything to gamer, aka the high settings, and ran the game in 1080p. Immediately, we had a bit of an issue. It was only using one of the GPUs, even though the game does support Crossfire, I had the latest drivers installed, and Crossfire was enabled. Got an average of 26 FPS with a minimum of 10, 1% lows of 19, and 0.1% lows of 15. The game would have ran better with lower settings, and I did try tweaking the card settings in the Catalyst Control Center, but it refused to use both GPUs. 
I don't know why. Next was Left 4 Dead, which worked a lot better and actually took full advantage of both processors. Finding games that actually supported multi-GPU setups and DirectX 10 was a bit challenging, but most popular games from the late 2000s still took advantage of this feature. It also got an average of 253 frames per second with a minimum of 28, 1% lows of 124, and 0.1% lows of 55 and 1080p with the medium settings. This game actually came out 11 days after the 4850X2 did, and it was easily able to prove itself in the newest titles upon release. After that was Borderlands 2. At this point our card would have been 4 years old and at this time a 4 year old gap meant the flagship hardware could start to struggle. We played this one in 1080p with the low settings and it got an average of 42 FPS with a minimum of 12, 1% lows of 15 and 0.1% lows of 13. Given that the card was only a few years old it's not quite as good as I would have hoped for but it did use both GPUs, was playable and relatively smooth so it's good enough. Dishonored also came out in 2012 and in 1080p with the medium set settings was able to run a lot better. It got an average of 59 FPS with a minimum of 12, 1% lows of 29, and 0.1% lows of 26. I also noticed that one of the GPUs seemed to be running about 15 degrees hotter than the other one, which was kind of odd, but to be fair, they were both staying pretty cool, around that 55 to 65 degrees Celsius mark. Maybe there's an airflow issue where one of my fans is going, but as a whole, it's still doing a pretty good job. Speaking of which, Mayor's Edge performed even better. In 1080p with the medium settings, it got an average of 60 with a minimum of 0, 1% lows of 10, and 0.1% lows of 9. I say better in that the average frame rate was higher, but the 1% lows and especially the minimum frame rate was a lot lower. This test in particular really demonstrates the micro stuttering issues I mentioned earlier, and it's beginning to make sense why we shifted away from multi GPU setups. I also ran Left 4 Dead 2 in 1080p with the medium settings and got an average of 226 with a minimum of 25, 1% lows of 104, and 0.1% lows of 58. Interestingly, the first couple times I launched the game and only used one of the two GPUs. It took a while for it to figure itself out, but eventually it did, so I can't complain. Now GTA 5 doesn't technically support Crossfire, but some people have been able to pull it off using this card. Personally, I couldn't get it working, so we ended up just using one of the two graphics processors. As expected, it didn't really run well, it only had a single 4850 pulling all the weight, and in 1080p with the normal settings got an average of 20, a minimum of 2, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 5. The second GPU would occasionally spike up to about 20%, but it never ran consistently. It's like it was trying its best, could work for a second, but couldn't maintain itself. I played two more games after this, first starting with CSGO. This one also didn't want to play nice with the second GPU, so only one was doing anything, and in 1080p with low settings got an average of 75, a minimum of 10, 1% lows of 30, and 0.1% lows of 36. Now I wasn't overclocking at all, so it definitely had room for improvement, but it was smooth and stable enough to be competitively playable. Finally was Minecraft in 1080p with the medium settings and a render distance of 8 chunks. This one also only used one of the GPUs and it got an average of 123, a minimum of 15, 1% lows of 52, and 0.1% lows of 20. I read somewhere online that Minecraft does support Crossfire so I'm kind of surprised that it didn't work. I don't know for sure, it could be an issue with my card or maybe that feature was only for an older version and they've since dropped support for it. In conclusion, it's a pretty cool card. It'll destroy any age appropriate game you throw at it, and it's relatively well designed. Even when both GPUs were under load, the card didn't get too hot or excessively loud. But its lack of support for modern graphics APIs and the lack of support for multi GPU setups in games truly makes this card a piece of history. It also probably had something a little wrong with it. Some games like Crisis didn't want to use both the GPUs, and I don't know why. This is my first time ever running games on a multi GPU setup, so let me know if you have any suggestions in the comments below. It's also a bit disappointing the Crossfire and SLI are a dead technology. Like, it looks cool. Having multiple graphics cards in your computer just looks cool. Like, four GTX 280s working in tandem is more visually appealing than a 4090 with all its flashy RGB. But, I get it. It makes sense. It's sort of easier and more practical to make a single, more powerful GPU instead of sticking two weaker GPUs on a single PCB or running them through a Crossfire cable. But, multi-GPU setups just look cooler. That's not my subjective opinion. That is a fact, and I am the source you can cite. Anyways, I enjoyed checking out this card. By the time I got around to building my first PC, dual GPU graphics cards were well into being phased out, but looking back at this beast from 2008 helps us get a better understanding of computing history. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider leaving a like or subscribing because it genuinely helps me out. If you want to join the community, there's a link to the official Jane Dyke Discord server in the description, and if you want to check out janedyke.com, that'd help the channel out. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below and I'll be sure to respond to them. That's about it. Have a great day. Bye.